So I wanted to start out first with a question to Samantha, uh, wondering, I know you pitched the story, the plot of the book to your mom while she was on tour, I read about that, but how did you come up with the concept for the book? Um, honestly, I was just in, um, I was in eighth grade French class and I was just daydreaming <laughs> and the idea just popped into my head and I thought, what must it be like when we close a book? Um, do, the characters can't just stop. The story can't just end. It has to keep going. So what's happening when we're not reading? And then it kind of expanded. <laughs> yeah. And so then, is that at the point, did you write anything down? Did you submit a proposal? Or did, <laughs> we're no, not quite that formal in our family. No. <laughs> I was just thinking about it. And I just told my mom about the idea. Yeah. It wasn't very developed. It was just kind of a concept. So you had gotten as far as a prince, though, because you, you, you told me that, you know, what if it was a fairy tale and a prince who wanted to get out of the fairy tale? So she'd already conceived that kind of framework. For and what was your reaction when you heard her? Well, I, she's had a lot of great ideas over the course of her lifetime. She's a, a really good writer and, um, and very creative, but a lot of the stuff that she's thought of would be great short stories, um, you know, poetry, things like that. Um, I can't tell you how many times she said, oh, I have this really good idea for a short story, and I thought... God, I wish I thought of that. <laughs> um, but this was the first thing that she ever mentioned that really felt big enough to be a book. And as an adult, I thought, this is brilliant. Every, every person who is a reader has fallen in love with a fictional character and has wished maybe if I dream hard enough, you know, he'll appear in my bedroom when I wake up. And, you know, I cop to a crush on Mr. Darcy, Mr. like Darcy. half the world. And, you know, anyone, any young adult reader who has been either Team Edward or Team Jacob has done the same. And... Um, you know, I really felt like this was a universal experience. And what if that crush of yours, that literary crush, actually came to life and needed your help escaping the book? How does, how does that evolve? And I thought, it's perfect, because it, it's something that would relate not just to kids, you know, to young adults who are reading, but also to the adults who have been readers their whole lives. And I said to her, let's write it. You know, let's do it. And so, I, I think she was pretty shocked. <laughs> yeah. Well, did you have, do you have a literary crush that you've, you know... Um, Probably Peta from The Hunger Games. Okay. Yeah. But only if he really looks like Josh Hutcherson. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that um, school library plays a big part in in your in your new novel. So, could you talk a little bit about the effect of um, the importance of school libraries, especially and libraries in general, on you know the influence on a young person's imagination? Mm -hmm. I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> you can do what you want to do, but um, I my very first job was as a page at a library, oh, really? and so um, you know I my mother was the one who first introduced me to libraries. We used to go two or three times a week, and my mother would, would inhale books. She just read you know one after another, and and that was modeled for me. So I literally was always coming home with a huge stack of books to read. And when my kids were little, that was how we read all of our books too. Um, you know, we used to go to the library every week. We used to do the programming at the library. They would come home with giant stacks. We would spend Fridays hunting down the books that they had lost around the house so that we could return them. And um, what I think libraries do is make reading accessible for everybody. There's no excuse if you have a library in your town. And um, that's what's so wonderful about libraries. Uh, in, in the book, in, um, in Between the Lines, Mrs. Winks plays a very important role because she is a confidant for Delilah, who is a total bookworm. And I think there are a lot of school librarians who meet kids like Delilah, who maybe don't fit in very well in a school environment and can escape into fiction or in, just even in, in the confines of a quiet library. I've met a lot of kids who hang out with the library staff in schools because they feel comfortable around them and because um, the library staff feeds their need for creativity and imagination by saying, you should read this, you should read this. In many ways, um, I think school librarians help open up a student's mind outside the world of a school and get them thinking about maybe where they want to be when they're older, what they want to do when they're older. And so they're very vital parts of a school community. What were you going to say? <laughs> oh, I was just going to say that for me, at least, the library is very important because I am such a picky reader, and if I don't like a book, it's really hard for me to finish. And I know that librarians help me find anything. They kind of just ask questions, and then they know what book would be perfect for me. And I've seen them do that with a lot of people, so it's really good that they can find anyone a book. Yeah, yeah it was just a, the Sherman Alexi. Um, he did a reading, or not a reading, but a talk, and he said that all librarians should have tattooed on their ankles. I have the perfect book for you. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Um, so, okay, well, so that's 
my next question is, um, librarians tend to be very fond of your work, and <laughs> I know the, um, the adoration is mutual. Can you explain why there's this phenomenon? There's a phenomenon? That's yeah. nice. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that, um, well, in terms of, of young adults and school librarians, what's really nice is that uh, I do write adult fiction. I've never, I've never claimed before now to write young adult fiction. And, um, and I, I think in much of, many of my adult novels, even though I'm, I'm writing from a very highly emotional standpoint um, with situations and crises that are definitely adult as opposed to youthful or young adult, um, I often include a character who is an adolescent. I do it because adolescents have a built-in BS meter. And if you put one in your book, you can get away with nothing. And none of the other characters can get away with anything either because everyone's held accountable to that one narrator, that one teenage narrator. So I love them. Um, I used to teach eighth grade English. Uh, I work with um, high school and middle school students now in drama. And I really like kids that age because of the, uh, the challenge they present and the creativity that they feed you. And uh, you know, I think that my books strike a chord with a lot of kids because if they are ready to read the emotional content of what I'm writing, um, they can find someone to relate to inside the book. It's not just a bunch of middle-aged men and women who are navel-gazing, which is something you might find in highly literary fiction. You know, you've got also a, a teenage narrator who's frustrated with his or her parents who might be undergoing some kind of, of crisis of faith or trying to figure out his or her place in the world. Um, for all those reasons, I think librarians have sort of latched onto my books as a really nice bridge for kids who are stepping from young adult literature into adult literature. Mm -hmm. It's a nice way to make that transition. Mm -hmm. Do you ever find your mom's taking notes after you've had like a bad day and she's like, you know, trying to capture some of the... I don't think so. I think the only time you used stuff about me as a teenager was in um, Send You Home. The girl, wasn't there a girl who was like a skater? Their daughter or something? I don't think so. There's some... I, I think that was some... in Handle of Care. Oh. It was in Handle of Care, yeah. But that was like basic, you know, that was skating yeah. knowledge. I just needed to know <laughs> terms or facts or something. Yeah. I actually try really hard not to put my kids into my books because I think that's really unfair. It's yeah. like they didn't sign on for this. Right. Right. So I try not to pirate from their lives. But I do pirate routinely from other people's lives. <laughs> They're just safe. Well, can you explain a little bit about the writing process, the two of you? How would the day look when you were collaborating? Um, so it was during my summer breaks, and we basically we had a kind of a set page number that we wanted to get to and set time limit because I had to have a time limit to know when, I was <laughs> <laughs> when yeah. to stop or yeah. when Because yeah. <laughs> I got distracted. <laughs> but... Um, so we would have we just go up in your office and we'd sit side by side and just write out um, just the scene, I guess. And we did like we did some talking back and forth when we got stuck. Um, we actually talked a lot. We would we would role play it. Sometimes. Yeah. So when we were doing dialogue, I would be you know if I was Oliver, she would be Delilah, mm -hmm. and we would just go back and forth. Mm -hmm. And we took turns typing, but usually I type because I'm faster. <laughs> and uh, yeah. and it, it got I think it got it was very collaborative, and that if I started to say something, she would finish the sentence. And there was a lot of, of that. It was very freaky. Very there were times when we started <laughs> to say the same thing. Like we were. It, it's like being in a dream and we're, we're being asleep and realizing that someone next to you is having the same dream. It was very very strange. I don't know if that's genetic or just really good collaboration or what. <laughs> I think that's also a lot of people who have been around each other for a long time can finish each other's thoughts. Yeah. yeah. Can do that. We'd be so good at like miming. Like game. Miming? You know, or like the newlywed game? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. The three things. Tell me the three things in her life. <laughs> um, so as a mom, I'm sure your inclination is to protect your children. And now that you're collaborating with one of your children... How, you know, you protecting them from bad reviews, criticism, that sort of thing. How do you, I mean, you have, had that's, to have thought about it. That's great. Um, I honestly, the, I, I'm a tiger mom when it comes to reviews because, or not just reviews, but media in general. I do think that, um, that this industry chews up authors and spits them out in many ways, and I've been in it for 20 years, and so it's great that I can be... Uh, the first, the first line of defense for Sammy. So, I mean, very often, if people, you know, said, "Well, I want to do this with her. I want to do that with her," I would, I was sitting there triaging the interviews and saying, "You could do this. You can't do this. You could, you know, this has been done before." Um, really cherry picking what I thought would be best 
worth her time because the, what most people were forgetting was that Sammy is she has a day job. Sammy is a student, and um, you know so obviously she finished school last week. She finished her finals last week, and we had this rush of newspapers who ignored all of the media requests up until this point and needed their interview when she had finals. And I said, this will not be happening because, you know, the most important thing for her is actually getting through her high school career. <laughs> so I'm glad that I was there to be able to say those things, and I'm glad that I have the club to be able to tell people to go away, you know, you should have done this earlier. Um, and also to, to also, you know, be able to say something like, uh, you know, oh, by the way, your cheek muscles are going to hurt after you smile a lot at a signing. Um, you know, because those are the things nobody thinks to tell you. I do think, you know, you actually said the other day, we haven't talked about reviews at all. And honestly, we've had a lot of wonderful blog reviews, but we had our first real review today in the LA Times. And it is, I swear to God, the nicest review I've had in 20 years of writing. So I'm packing it all in. I'm only going to write YA fiction from now on, apparently. <laughs> and um, it was this glowing, wonderful review, and I hope I hope they're all like that. That would be fantastic. But um, you said to me, well, you know, we're not going to make everyone happy all the time, when she, she actually read it online a couple days ago. And, and that's a really zen approach, one I wish I could emulate when I'm in the <laughs> middle of reading all my adult reviews. Because, um, you know, you still always kind of take it to heart, even when you say you're not going to. But there will be someone who says something nasty. I have no doubt about it. But I think you have a really, you know, level head on your shoulders. And I think there are going to be a lot of kids um, and a lot of, of moms who read this and really enjoy it for what it is. Um, the other thing that I anticipate being an issue is that young adult is a very broad category. Young adult encompasses preteens all the way up through 18-year-olds. And... Um, I can tell you right now that although I think an 18-year-old can enjoy this book and would enjoy this book, it is skewed to me quite heavily towards the younger set. Because kids who are 18 could be reading my adult fiction. This is really for the kids who aren't ready for some of the emotional stuff that I write as an adult, but who you know, might want to play around with the kind of writing that I do, multiple narratives, but also enjoy a story that's really teen-centric and that is imaginative and that um, has absolutely nothing objectionable in it whatsoever. <laughs> you know, so I think, like, a 13-year-old girl, if I read this when I was 13, I would be like, oh, my God, I'm in love with this book. This is the perfect book. Um, that, to me, seems the right demographic. So I, I also have no doubt, because um, I've run across this with my fans before, that some of my adult fans are going to be like, what is this? This, what, what are you, why are you writing this? This isn't one of your books. This is so different. This is such a departure from right. one of your books. It's supposed to be a departure from one of my books. You know, I mean, I know that no matter how many times I, I say on my website or in print, this is a young adult novel, this is different from my other books, um, someone's going to be disappointed and is going to say something nasty because the Internet allows you to say nasty things now, um, which I do think is a really big problem, uh, in, you know, that goes much beyond your question. But I, uh, I, I just hope that, you know, I think she's looking forward to the good stuff that's going to happen. I think she's got a good head on her shoulders for the, the nasty things that are going to be said. And, you know, I think overall she's going to have the same experience that I do when I'm on tour, which is she's going to feel a lot of love in a room, um, probably more than you are even expecting when you start getting people coming up to you saying, I love this, I love this, and this character, you know, I mean, they, they get so real to the people who read it. That's the magic of being an author. And to realize that your story has come to life for someone other than just yourself is a big deal. Um, you know, and then you just sort of put into perspective the fact that there are going to be people who don't like it. And you say, thank you, I'm sorry, this wasn't your cup of tea. I hope you can find something more to your liking. Now, that's interesting, because I wonder if, you know, you, you do have a Zen approach to all of this. And I wonder if social media kind of... Yeah. You know, prepared you for that. Yeah. You know, because everything is so public and documented, mm. and everyone has. Yeah, I'm just old. She's not. You know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you are ready for the bad reviews if there are any, and yeah. I'm sure you know. I, I know we won't please everyone because yeah. I know, like, like I said, I'm a picky reader. It's not everyone loves every book, so I'm totally fine if no one. Yeah. Yeah. She can Someone pat me on the back when I'm crying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you're giving <laughs> advice to her more than the other way around. Yeah. So other than smiling and handwriting, what other kinds of advice have you given um, for not only the circuit, but also just as a writer? <laughs> I think the most advice I've actually given her has been related to the tour. Um, you know, because uh, there's a lot about being on a, a tour junket that people don't think about and nobody thinks about for you. And it, it's silly things like sleep when you can. You are your own time zone. You know, eat when you have the opportunity because you don't know where your next meal is coming from. All of those things are um, are things I've gotten used to when I've toured extensively. And she's doing, you know, she's really having a baptism by fire. 
She has a one-month tour that encompasses um, three continents without a break. So that's <laughs> intense. Um, that's her summer vacation. You know, she's going to get to see a lot of cool stuff, but she's also going to be working really, really hard. And, you know, the, I think the other thing that really surprised me was I actually went into writing this with Sammy thinking I would be providing her with a lot of advice. I would be the mentor. And over the course of writing, it became very clear to me that um, I was, I stopped treating her like a mentee and really started to see her as an intellectual equal when it came to the art of writing because her instincts were very strong and um, some of the arguments that we would talk out in the book, um, often she would be right. Is there some civil, sibling rivalry now that, um, you know, now that, or your brother's wanting to... You can take that one. <laughs> Kyle was jealous that we were going on the tour. Um, yeah, because Jake, Jake is, um, my brother Jake, he wrote a play with my mom and got it published. It's not quite as big as this. Yeah. He didn't get to go on tour. But um, they're both doing pretty, like, wonderful things right now. So I think they're really They're really happy strong. for you. I mean, yeah. they are really happy for they you. Are. you know, they retweet her reviews and stuff like that. But, um, you know, they, they are really happy for her. But, yeah, her older brother, who is 20, is like, yeah, you're going to Australia? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Bring him back for gifts. Yeah. Right. A little koala bear. Right. <laughs> So what's been the biggest surprise for you so far with doing the tour? I guess it's technically starting, but yeah. I mean. um, well, since we've had a day of it, it was <laughs> Disneyland for most of it. <laughs> um, what do you find that will be a big surprise? Or I think um, what my mom said about having people come up to me and be like, I loved your book just because at home only my friends had read it, and they have to be nice to me. <laughs> so... <laughs> They were all very supportive and happy for me, and it's going to be weird to meet a stranger who is so in love with something that I made. It's just going to be really weird. And also, if they like read about me and they know about me, but I have no idea who they are. <laughs> yeah. There's so an weird. element of creepy. And then, <laughs> a little. Yeah. Well, one of the biggest questions we get all the time is, "Is that you on the book cover? Because oh it looks a lot God. like Sammy, oh. and it isn't Sammy, but yeah. um, apparently it looks enough like her that everybody Number wants to one know." Question. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Well, that's all I have. So thank Great. you again sure. for thank you so making much. time.